America faces a big choice on November the 5th. And we who believe in reproductive freedom. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than they won. Perhaps the most important election in recent history is too close to call. But whatever happens on election day and in the weeks that follow, the America that we thought we knew is gone and it isn't coming back. It's the enemy from within, all the scum that we have to deal with. Join me, Dr Emma Shortis, on After America as we discuss the final weeks of the campaign and how this election will change our world forever. After America is brought to you by the Australia Institute. Subscribe now, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello and welcome to Dollars and Cents, the Australia Institute podcast where we're talking about just what the hell is going on in the economy. I'm Eleanor johnston Leake, the senior content producer here at the Australia Institute, and as always, I'm talking to our chief economist, Greg Jericho. Hello, Greg. Hi, Eleanor. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's a few Ooh. weeks off, but glad to be back. Yeah. yeah. No longer taking the con out of the economy. We're back to explaining yeah. what the hell is going on. We're in putting the it back in. Yeah. <laughs> we had to banish Hayden for going off script, so it's good that we've got the team back together. The A team. <laughs> the A team. <laughs> So, Greg, in the news this week, the Albanese government has announced plans to crack down on debit card fees. The Albanese government says it's prepared to ban debit card surcharges if re-elected. It says the move is to help ease the cost of living. These charges are just downright unfair. They're excessive and we think that they should be banned. Consumers are right. They don't think it's fair that they get slugged surcharges for accessing their own money particularly when it's becoming harder and harder and harder for them to access their cash through an ATM or a bank branch. I think it's a a welcome move. I think it'll be good for consumers and it'll be good for small business. So, you know, when you go to pay for a coffee or something and there's a surcharge for using a debit card, that would be banned under the new proposed plan. So, Greg, what does this mean for people and for businesses? Do businesses miss out on this charge if it goes ahead or who's actually getting the the money from the surcharges. Yeah, it's it's a really difficult question actually because these charges it's so opaque, you know, trying to actually one even know what you're paying because mm. it's not like it's on a menu or or on the price item on a shelf or something. You don't know it until you've paid it. You would be there thinking, "Oh, a debit card that's basically equivalent to cash, so it's not like yeah. a credit, and yet they're often the same rate, even though there is high cost for doing credit cards. Think, oh, it's all going to the banks, but it's not because a lot of it is actually going to the people who supply all those FPOS machines that you see there. It's not like the Commonwealth Bank has put those FPOS machines in there. There is an FPOS company that supplies these, and there's various types of them. They're taking a cut, and... You know, when I'm talking about FBOS, I'm talking about what we kind of think generically is the, the type of payment rather than the, the literal brand FBOS. So, yeah, we're talking here about the, all the direct deposit electronic machines that you see being used because they're not the same at every business. They'll be a different one. So there are different companies that supply each of those things. Everyone's kind of taking a cut except for the small business owner or or the business owners, but especially small business owners because they don't have much leverage with either the FPOST um, providers or, or banks or anything. They're not like Woolies or Coles or big companies who can say, hey, we'll buy your FPOST machines mm. if you if you offer us deals. But even with that, we've seen some fairly dodgy sort of things uh, involving higher surcharges being paid and the the companies the the businesses um are getting benefits from the machine makers because they're it's a lot more complicated than i thought it really is complicated and why it is terrible is because it's all kind of happening behind the scenes we don't know what i should be getting charged here you're often not even really seeing it especially if you're just sort of putting the card up against the machine, you, you're kind of not even registering, especially if you're buying a whole lot of things. And yep. unless you've actually worked out exactly what these are costing, you're probably not going to know. And that is what this is all about. Is like, okay, even if businesses have to pass on those costs, 
pass it on up front so you add it to the price of a flat white. Yeah. Instead of it being four dollars. That's pretty pretty cheap for a flat white these I days. I haven't bought a flat white for a very <laughs> long time. <laughs> Bring my coffee from home, a bit of oh, travel bug. Good I'm, for you. I'm very old fashioned. <laughs> How much is a flat white these days? Five, five dollars. Five okay. bucks. Yeah. So instead of like buying a flat white for five bucks and you pay for it with a credit card or pay for it on debit card and you probably don't even notice that maybe 2% has been added or mm. in some place I've seen sto- um, stories of 10% being added. Oh, what? Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's like you don't even sort of register. You're sort of like, oh, yeah, I thought I was just paying five yeah. bucks because they always – They'll say, oh, yeah, five bucks, and you'll hit it, and you, yep. know, you kind of don't even register. And most people, like, don't bring cash anyway, so yeah, it's exactly. not many much So not instead of options. that happening, they'll say it's $5.20, mm. and you blip it, and you pay $5.20. And so it's more about not hiding the, the costs because when the costs are hidden, that's when consumers, one, don't know they're paying, don't know are we being ripped off, am I getting what I paid for and it also enables opportunities for the different companies and banks along the way to add their little bit. You know, it's also opaque. So that's kind of what the government is really trying to, to get rid of, that complete lack of transparency. For example, if you go back to, say, the GST, that was one of the key things when the GST was introduced. And I don't know, you're far too young, so you I won't actually, I understand I don't remember this, that, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was a big part of it that companies could not – Put in their prices five dollars plus GST. Yeah, you know the GST was included in the full price because they really wanted to avoid what you have in America, where if you go to America, you'll buy something and on you'll see, oh, I'll grab this. It's five bucks, mm. and then you go to the cash register and you find, oh, I've got to pay the state sales tax. I've got to pay a federal sales tax. Got to pay a tip if I if I'm if it's involving yeah. things, and so one of the Probably, if we're going to say one of the good things about the GST was they avoided that and said, no, nah, we're not going to let you do that. And so, in a sense, they're trying to have that happening here, yep. that you're not allowed to say, oh, yeah, it's five bucks plus the plus surcharge. Tax, yeah. From movie theatres to the links and even bowling alleys, the cost of a family outing at certain times is surging. Dan said good riddance to attending Green Day's concert as dynamic prices had to ticket costs up to $500. Buying tickets to a concert is an emotional purchase. It's not a thing I like buying a pair of sand shoes. It's like you really want to go, you're invested in the artist. And this concern that Australia's once thriving grassroots industry is now becoming something that only rich people can afford. And I think this whole dynamic pricing thing is purely just driven by greed, you know? It's like, why not make more money? And along the same lines, also this week, the Albanese government has announced plans to ban dodgy trading practices. So this is including things like hidden fees and dynamic pricing. Albanese said that hidden fees and traps are putting even more pressure on the cost of living and it needs to stop. So are these significant cost of living measures or are these just sort of tinkering around the edges here? How much of a difference would these changes actually make? Oh, look, in the grand scheme of things, if you're talking like how's it going to affect inflation, not at all, really. Mm. But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It, it's a good thing, especially when you think about things like the dynamic pricing. Yeah. Four Corners had an episode that looks at that where, you know, for example, concert tickets and uh, I know Green Day concert tickets were one of the more mm. recent examples of this where suddenly prices were $500. I think Oasis yep. are doing the same. Not very they? punk rock of Green Day. No, no. And it's basically, I mean, it's because in Australia, basically it's Ticketmaster and uh, Ticket Tech, yeah. who pretty much control the concert market. They control, in a sense, the market, so they really have the say over how we're going to do it. And they say, oh, this is a really good thing because it yeah. prevents scalping. So and it's dy- like, no. Dynamic what? pricing, just to be clear, if if I'm correct, it's um, the price changes according to demand. So some tickets, if the concert's really popular, could go into several hundreds, thousands even of dollars. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we saw for the Australian Open finals, they've got dynamic pricing. And so literally what happens is you've logged onto the website or the app and you're waiting and waiting for these tickets. And they might have started off originally the 150 bucks and they've got an asterisk there saying subject to dynamic pricing. Yeah. You're waiting for two hours. You're told you're in the queue. You've got so many thousands of people in front of you. They drop out and finally you get there. 
and you find out, oh no, it's three hundred and fifty bucks or it's yeah. four hundred, and you'll be given thirty seconds or so to say yes. Otherwise, yeah. you're booted out of the system. You've lost your place in the queue. And yeah. so, what critics are saying, and I think this is a really good one, is it's in a sense not so much offering a dynamic price as almost it's you're gambling. And you've got in a thing where you're trying to win because getting tickets is is like winning, you know, especially mm. if you're trying to get tickets to Oasis where there is a huge demand. You kind of get there. I've won. Then you go, oh, it's 350 bucks. That's more than, oh, yeah, what do I do? Oh, 30 seconds sh- to 30. decide. <laughs> okay, I'll go click. And yeah. you're like, oh, I didn't really have time, you know, and it's yeah. almost this sense of, oh, how – Stupid would I feel if I've waited two and a half hours or so and I get there and I say, oh, no, I'm not going to buy them. It, it's mm. it's putting the consumer in a really invidious position and it's kind of just shitty. Yeah. <laughs> and also it's, let's be honest, it's got nothing to do with scalping. It is yeah. about in the same way as with Uber and you have surge pricing for when there's events on or when there's a, an accident occurs and public transport is down for a period and people are suddenly wanting to to hire Ubers and so there will be surge pricing going on. It's got nothing to do with assisted consumers. It's got all to do with delivering profit, in this case delivering really delivering profit to Ticketmaster and and Ticketek and the ones that actually do this. Um, It doesn't need to be done. Taylor Swift didn't do it. Um, (laughs) Your fave. Yeah. Good old Taylor. Well done. (laughs) Mind you, she didn't give me a ticket even though I waited for 10 hours for Aww. a ticket. So Yeah, yeah. sorry to remind you. Um, but also what it means, it does mean because, one, it's hard enough to have the time to actually wait for all these tickets and it is, it is just a lottery. But now it becomes a lottery that favours people who have got the money to be able to afford. Yeah. And also in- increases the risk of, People, when you think about who goes to concerts and that, a lot of teenagers who parents might have given them the credit card and said, yep, mm. okay, and are they going to say no when they get there and they find out, oh, the, the ticket price is 200% higher than I thought it was going to be, but we've finally got, we've, we're we here, we got tickets, you yeah, know? Yeah, especially if you're trying to go with friends and you're trying yeah. to organise and then you have to kind of figure out in 30 seconds if everyone exactly. wants to spend that much. Exactly. Yeah. So I think a good idea getting rid of it, also, the other thing with getting rid of those hidden fees, because again, as I was saying, with regards to the debit card fees, it's all stuff that, oh, I thought this is what I was paying. Oh, no, there was this charge and then this charge. It's so annoying when one of the things with concerts and you know, theatre performance and all that, you'll have to pay a, a fee for actually printing out the ticket at home. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, they, you they know, give you a fee for like, oh, we'll email you the tickets. Yeah, like, can you just include that in the price? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. You know, why am I paying yeah. $9.95 or something to, to get it emailed to me that isn't? Yeah. So it's those type of things. And, and obviously a big one is airline tickets. Mm. There's always those extra things yeah. along. Or the, Airbnb. Airbnbs yeah. as well and all that. Those things where, oh, you thought you were paying, but that was actually just the initial purchase to actually get all the things and the experience of whatever. You got to pay all these other things, not yep. being upfront about them, and them saying, "Oh no, they were all optional extras." And you go, "Really? Uh, if I didn't do them, am I actually even going on this trip or doing all these things?" And being a bit more honest about it. So, yeah, good thing. I think. Okay, so probably not going to have a huge impact necessarily on cost of living, but not a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the amount of concert tickets purchased is not a massive factor in people's consumption habits. Yeah. Every, you know, They're more of a luxury got, purchase. Yeah, it's got yeah. nothing on the price of, or the cost of groceries and, and uh, insurance and things like that. But that doesn't, you know, you don't have to do everything as a government just to make inflation better you do it because this is fairer this is better for people mm. and i think it's a, a good a good uh, policy amen yeah yeah all right so greg in your column this week in the guardian you were talking about skill shortages so at the moment where are we which industries are seeing skill shortages and how bad is it yeah skill shortages are pretty widespread i gotta say mm. um over all 
occupations. And the reason I wrote it uh, this week is because this week as well, the Department of Jobs and Skills brought out their annual occupational shortage list, basically. They go through around, I think it's around 915 different occupations. So at a really sort of niche level of occupations. And they survey businesses in every state and essentially ask, is there, you know, do you have trouble getting staff? Yeah. Do you have trouble filling vacancies? And so they record shortages in each state and also at just at the national level as well. And what they found across all of those 915-odd occupations that about 33% of them were suffering skill shortages. And what they oh, mean wow. by that is yeah. they were unable basically to get qualified, suitable staff. Yeah. So that's a 33%, fair bit. 33%. Yeah. 33%. It's down a touch from last year, which is good, but it's still higher than it was in 21 and 2022. Um, so it's still pretty high. But within that, what we see is that there are certain sectors of the economy that have a lot more skill shortages and certain types of jobs have a lot more skill shortages. Which types of jobs see the most shortages? Generally the ones that require more skills. Okay. Which yep. kind of makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Kind of makes sense. So the, the Bureau of Stats uh, categorizes jobs according to five skill levels. And skill level one is the highest with you need a bachelor degree or higher. Then the next one, associate diploma, diploma. Skill level three is certificate four or certificate three with a couple years on the job training. Skill level four is certificate two or three. And then the final skill level is essentially we're talking, you know, you, you completed high school or maybe not even that. So essentially you can basically, you know, for example, teenagers who are working at McDonald's, there's no skill level sort of required for that. So that's the skill level five. Those in skill one um, have a very high level of job shortage. About 39% of occupations that require a bachelor degree or higher have skill shortages. But actually the biggest area of skill shortages is the skill level three. And the reason being skill level three is where you need a certificate four or certificate three qualification with a couple years of experience. And what we're really talking about there, because if people don't know what cert certificate four and three are, we're talking trades. Yeah. And that also goes to the type of occupations and occupations that involve technicians and trade workers, half. Half, half. of those jobs have skill shortages. Oh, my God. Massive skill shortages yeah. in those areas. And then when we look at the types of industries, construction is the number one. 69% of all jobs in the construction industry have skill shortages. Mm. Massive. So more than two thirds. Yeah. That's which is crazy. Quite, <laughs> it's quite crazy, really. And just below that, the industry with the second most uh, number of skill shortages is the mining industry. So why are these industries in particular experiencing such serious shortages? Well, again, think about the type of work that is needed in those industries. You, you're going to need skills like uh, trades and, and training. So you're mm. either going to need to have a certificate or especially areas in construction and mining, you need engineers. So you need mm. degrees. So you put those two together. They're the two type of industries that need the skills that are most in demand and that's why those two industries are the ones that have the most shortages. So, Greg, one of the fixes that you see suggested for skill shortages a lot is uh, an increase to immigration levels. And considering how much immigration is a bit of a hot button issue at the moment, I'd imagine that that would not actually be a popular solution here. So, but is it a, is it a viable option? Look, we we do have at the moment fairly high levels of migrants with either skilled visas, whether it's permanent or temporary skilled visas or work visas, a high level of sort of if we talk in total number, but if we look at it as a share of total employment, it's actually less at the moment now than it was sort of the decade before the pandemic and even a bit below where it was right at the end of the mining boom in 2007, 2008. So in net terms as well, when you take into account the fact that people with those work visas also leave the country. So we've got yeah. people coming and going. If we look in terms of the net, it's not actually that big of a thing. It's certainly not a case that we've got migrants all coming here, taking our gerbs. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And also the fact that 
we've got a a fairly uh, high level of migration, but we also have still pretty low unemployment historically. Mm. You know, four point two percent, still pretty low. We'd like it to be below four percent, but again, that's not been affected by migration as such because we can still see that you know half of trades and training. Uh, technicians are uh, short of workers. You yeah, know, we need more workers. So it's a case of actually migration is a bit of a just a band aid fix. Yeah. What the the great thing about the report shows is that there are some real more long term key fixes that can be done that will hopefully not only reduce the shortages but actually be good for workers' wages as well. What kind of solutions would that be? Well, one of the – was really interesting when I saw it, but then when I sort of stepped back, I thought, well, duh, it's pretty obvious. But what the report showed was occupations where 80% of the workers or more are men or 80% of the workers or more are women are more likely to have skill shortages than mm. those occupations where the makeup of them is more equal across men and women. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, and you think, okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. Why yeah. That? And then you think about, oh, yeah, if, you're only, if your pool of workers is only half of the population, yeah, that's got to make it twice as difficult to, to get the jobs as if you're going, yeah, I'll take anybody, whether you're yeah. a man or a woman. <laughs> and so what the, the report really shows is that a good way to fix these solution, uh, school shortages in the long term is get more women working in trades and engineering and things like that. But also it showed it wasn't just, you know, plumbers and electricians and things like that, but even things like IT and mm. and getting to to things that aren't, you know, your your typical sort of, oh, that's the bloke's job, you know, yeah. the blue collared bloke's job. But no, even in sort of the professional sector that have tendencies for for men are often in great shortage. But also on the other side, getting more men into care work, mm. into Teaching, my wife, for example, she's a teacher, and it is really tough to get men in primary school and middle school teaching roles now. They'll go towards senior school mm. and university lecturing, but primary school has become overwhelmingly woman dominated now. And we have shortages in teachers across the entire country, which is just a bizarre thing in a rich country like Australia. Yeah that we're struggling to find enough teachers. One of the things they could do, but they don't do, is maybe raise the wages of these things. I would imagine that would probably make those industries more attractive to work in. It would. Yeah. And it's certainly something we've seen in the care sector with the government uh, recently increasing, a massive increase in, in the salaries of, of uh, care workers, aged care workers, that certainly helps. One of the interesting things, though, from this report, they asked, because they were asking employers, you know, have you got shortages? Have you got troubles getting your your vacancies filled? Mm. And if they said, yeah, we are, they asked, well, what'd you do about it? Most of them say, and about three quarters of them say, oh, we just keep advertising. Yeah. <laughs> or we advertise in a different place. 3% actually said, oh, don't know what we do, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> but 1% said, oh, we think about raising the the wage that we're offering. So just one percent. Yeah. So more oh, <laughs> more employers didn't know what they did than the amount who actually did raise Thought, the wage. Hang so, on a second. Yeah. So yeah. it really is is a bit of a rebuttal to this line, oh, it's all about demand and supply. And if you want stronger yeah. wage, you know, if there's a big need for labor, then they'll increase wages and the market will find an equal no. I mean, look, if I'm being kind I would say that employers and especially small business owners, they're setting a price for labour, that wage, and they've probably made a calculation, this is what we can afford. Mm. And they've also made a calculation, this is what the going rate is. But there, there's no sort of response of, oh, maybe we're wrong and we got to pay yeah. more. They're, maybe they're, the they're, workers made yeah. a calculation about what they want to earn. And yeah, and they'd be much up, more yeah. likely, the employers are much more likely not only just to keep advertising, but also they'd be much more likely to just go, oh, well, let's reorganise the, the business so that we can cover that, that need than yeah. think, oh, maybe we need to pay workers more, <laughs> which is, as I say, a, a 
fit a nice little rebuttal to those people out there who think it's all about the invisible hand of the market determining wages. It certainly is not. But again, what the figures show is that if you do have these sectors that have not only a good gender balance, but do have that sort of overall higher salary that will in time attract more workers. And that's why it's a good thing that we are seeing higher salaries for care workers because they're in massive shortage and it's very hard to convince you know, a school leaver to think or, or someone in year 10, what am I going to do when I leave school? You, you are thinking, you know, you might, everyone might have their, their dream job, but you're also thinking, what, what's actually going to pay me something? Yeah, or if you're already in that role, you might yeah. be more li- less likely to leave. Exactly, and so that is, is a key thing. But also one of the interesting things at the other end of the scale rather than the school leavers They also found that occupations that had higher percentages of workers over 55 were less likely to be in shortage as well. So it's a case Mm. of if you are an employer worried about shortage, one thing you can do is stop just thinking of men or women as being able to fill your position and also don't think, oh, they're 50, 55, they're too old for the position. Mm. You know, you've got to be a bit broader in your views. But with that as well, you know, it's not all going to be solved by, oh, we can get lots more older workers in because obviously there's some jobs that older workers can't do, such as a lot of the trade stuff and labouring stuff and things like that. Mm. But it really does highlight that a lot of the fixes for these things, they're not. it's not about get more migrants in and, and it is actually about let's pay these workers a bit more and also let's think long term, and this is where the government really needs to get involved in ensuring that the training is done and that the work environment is such that it is welcoming to both men and women. Yeah. Because if you have got systems and, and a culture in place where women are not welcome or if men are doing that job, people are thinking, oh, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, why are you doing this job? This is a woman's job. If that kind of culture continues it doesn't really matter what the wage is going to be people aren't going to take it up and so there's long-term problems that needed to be solved and fixed but the other good thing about all that especially on the gender side of thing is we also know that if you get more women in male-dominated employment their average wage goes up and if more men come into women-dominated jobs everyone's average wage goes up because basically we live in a patriarchal society <laughs> where- You don't need to remind me. <laughs> yeah, where male-dominated jobs generally pay more on average. And, mm. you know, I've done the figures where 96% of all occupations, men get paid more than women on average. Um, but it's a case of one of the ways helping that is get women into those jobs where men have high average incomes because they get paid more. But also, weirdly, really stupidly, when you suddenly get more men working in a job than before, magically the amount that is offered as the wage seems to rise. Yeah. And it's so, the invisible hand, Greg. Yeah. So it's a case of it would not only help with skill shortages, it would actually help with the gender pay gap as well. Mm. And so that's a real win-win. But again, long term, because you might say, oh, we let's get all these certificates three and two people we're talking a couple years plus training and all that you know Mm. it's not going to be a short um a quick fix but it's it's one that's urgent and it would be nice to not always be worrying about this in another 10 years time all right well that's probably about all we've got time for today greg thanks so much thanks eleanor Really good chat, really complex issues, but uh, always good to sort of uh, lift the lid and see what's lurking underneath in this economy. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again with another Dollars and Cents. This episode of Dollars and Cents was recorded on Wednesday, the 16th of October, and some things may have changed. You can find my column, Grogonomics, which has got all the data looking at all the skill shortages across the economy on the Guardian Australia site. And for more research on skill shortages and all things going on in the economy, go to our website, which is at australiainstitute.org.au. My Twitter handle and the handle I use all social media is at Grogs Gamut and Eleanor is at Eleanor 
J underscore L. <gasps> you got it right I this time. Right. Well, no, it's written here, oh. so I was able to just well. read it. You know, so. That's okay. Still, I think applause is needed. But, you know, okay. anyway. Our theme music, as always, is from Blue Dot Sessions. Thank you all for listening. See you all next week. See ya. Mm-hmm.